In this brief introduction to the book of Acts, chapter 1, verses 1 through 11, its author Luke presents the major themes of the entire book, providing an outline of its contents which match the spread of Christianity between the years 33 and 62 CE, or AD. The first two verses read, In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and to teach, until the day when he was taken up, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. A couple of notes on this passage. First, some ancient writers used to dedicate their books to a patron who supported them financially. In these verses 1 and 2, Luke connects this book with his gospel by introducing seven themes that he will amplify or explain in the following verses, much as a bud grows and expands into a flower. These seven themes include Luke's role as historian by uniting the gospel of Luke. Secondly, Jesus' historical deeds, mainly his suffering and death. Thirdly, Jesus' teaching on the subject of the kingdom of God. Fourthly, Jesus' chosen apostles, namely the eleven who were still alive. Fifthly, Jesus' last commands, which were to wait and to become witnesses. Sixthly, Jesus' soon ascension, now risen he was soon to be taken up into heaven. And seventhly, Jesus and the Holy Spirit, that is, Jesus had promised his coming. If you lead a discussion group, then we recommend that you pose queries such as these and discuss together various replies. A. What was Luke's previous book, called a Logos in Greek? Well, that was the Gospel of Luke. And who was Theophilus? There are two main interpretations of who he was. He may have been Luke's patron who supported his writing project. Some suggest that this is any reader who loves God or who is loved by God, which is the meaning of the name Theophilus. Some will want to know what period is included between began to do and until he was taken up. Again, there are two main interpretations. One, that which Jesus began on earth, he continues to do from heaven. Otherwise, it is the period between Jesus' birth and his resurrection. And what commands did Jesus give after his resurrection? Other than the Great Commission, in verses 4 and 8, it was to remain in Jerusalem and to wait for the Father to send the Holy Spirit. And what was it that Jesus did through the Holy Spirit? Well, there are two interpretations. One is that Jesus gave commands through the Spirit. However, Luke's Gospel says nothing about such an idea. And secondly, if this phrase looks forwards to verses 5 and 8, then it may mean simply about the Holy Spirit. Verse 3 reads, He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during forty days, and speaking about the kingdom of God. One note, the kingdom of God has several meanings in the Bible, but for many ancient Jews it meant that God would one day make Israel to rule over all nations. Now, Jesus never denied this meaning. When you study with others, you might discuss these queries. F. What was Jesus suffering? Well, of course, this included his arrest, beatings, scourging, and crucifixion. What were Jesus' many proofs? Well, in this context, they include his appearing, his speaking, showing his wounds, eating together, and doing so repeatedly during 40 days. 
the number 40 has a lot of significance for Old Testament readers. H. What did Jesus say about the kingdom of God? Well, this is elaborated in verses 6 and 7. Mainly that Jesus has inaugurated the kingdom of God, but the Father has delayed its fulfillment. In verses 4 and 5, While staying with them, Jesus ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which, he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Baptism in the Holy Spirit is one of the main themes of the book of Acts. The event of the baptism in the Holy Spirit happens four times in the Acts. First, with new Jewish believers. Secondly, with new Samaritan believers. Thirdly, with the first Gentile believers in Jesus. And lastly, with disciples of John the Baptist. Thus, in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, Paul will write, In one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free. With your study groups, you might want to discuss what was so important about Jerusalem. First, Jerusalem was where Jews and Gentile converts would be gathering by their thousands, including those from the lost northern tribes of Israel. Jerusalem was one day to become the capital city of Messiah's coming kingdom, whence his glory was to go out to the nations. Important for Hebrew Bible readers, Jerusalem is Mount Zion, otherwise called Harmoched, mispronounced in Greek as Armageddon, also called the Far North, the city of the great king. What does it mean to be baptized in the Holy Spirit? We shall discuss this in other lessons, but see verse 8, where it is defined as when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Verse 6, So, when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Well, he said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed it by his own authority. A couple of notes. The term come together could also be translated enjoying a meal together, for the term literally means taking salt together. And then the kingdom. Now that Messiah was come, his followers expected him to make Israel great again. Discuss together, how does Christian hope build upon Jewish eschatology, that is, the hope of future things? Most Christians affirm Israel's future hope. Likewise, we affirm that Israel's future has begun with Jesus' coming, death, resurrection, and ascension as reigning king. Yet most Christians affirm that final fulfillment awaits Jesus' return. Most Christians affirm that all Gentile communities must receive Jesus' good news before Jesus' return and fulfill his reign on earth. Discussion query L. What are some of the times and seasons about which we have learned from other scriptures? These times and seasons possibly include when Israel was invaded and made desolate. The days or seasons are evil, Paul wrote to the Ephesians. Stand in the evil day, the rebellion and rule of Antichrist. Forty-two months of troubles and endurance, Jesus coming in clouds as conqueror. Then the day of the Lord, followed by a thousand-year reign, if it is to be taken literally, and the everlasting new heaven and earth. Verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. 
We've noted before that Luke structures the entire book of Acts by this pattern. Some Greek speakers called Rome the end of the earth, and others Tarshish or Spain, where Paul would later seek to go. You might discuss together what would power from the Holy Spirit enable Jesus' apostles to do? At least, to bear witness to what they had heard Jesus say and had seen him do, and to undertake mission to ethnic communities in other regions. Discuss together, what does power from the Holy Spirit enable Christians to do today? Obviously, we continue the Apostles' mission into the nations. And what else? What is more? The final verses. When he had said these things as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And when they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way in which you saw him go into heaven. You might note that in these verses, the word heaven could have two meanings. One, the visible sky, and the other, the invisible abode of God. We would like to note that Angels from the invisible heaven often appear in the Bible as men. Nowhere in the Bible do angels have wings. Discuss further, what was that cloud? The usual interpretations include, well, an atmospheric cloud of water vapor. Others suggest a crowd of heavenly beings. Most likely, a cloud of glory from God. And P, why did God choose to remove Jesus from earth in such a silly, visible manner? Well, here are some suggestions. So that his apostles would know that he really still exists, is alive, and is in his glorified body. Secondly, so that all Christians would know what to look for upon Jesus' return and appearance in the clouds. And lastly, so that Bible readers may know that Jesus is the Son of Man, described in Daniel 7, verses 13 and 14.